So we have a number of presentations. Um, the first one up is a presentation from Ezra Schuster, who Namuta uh, will introduce shortly. Uh, but he is the central government regional lead, uh, working um, with other central government agencies and local government and community in terms of COVID recovery and other matters. We have um, representation from Enviro Hub, uh, who are going to present to us from Sustainable Business Network, and then a little bit later from uh, the Tauranga, or should I call it, Western Bay of Plenty Transport System Plan. So a number of very interesting uh, presentations for us to get through. So, without further ado, Namuta, would you be kind enough to introduce, uh, who's coming in by Zoom, uh, Ezra. Good Samoa too, Namuta. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce today Ezra Schuster who is the Public Service Lead for the Toimwana Bay of Plenty uh, area. He's the Director of Education, uh, and I will hand over to him. Thank you, Namuta. Good morning. Morena. Morena. Maro lovelessly. Fua mō ma lingua mā. Thank you, Namuta. And also, uh, can I extend my thanks to the committee and for the councillors for the invitation to present this morning. Um, uh, I appreciate too that um, time is against us, so what I will do uh, for the benefit of, of the select committee is just to give you um, an overview of the role that I play as the regional public service lead. Um, and what I will do at this point in order to keep myself on track, because uh, um, I'm assuming that there'll be questions, that, um, I'll just share my screen in a moment, I'll share a presentation with you, so bear with me. Just got to ensure that I share the right screen here. Um, there are a number of things that um, the committee has asked me to, to touch on, but what I thought I'll first do is set a bit of context for the role that I play. So as I mentioned, um, I've, I have two roles. <laughs> what my substantive role is um, as Director of Education for the Bay of Lady, which uh, goes from uh, Tūrangi Orefutakati across to the Eastern Cape. However, in, um, at the end of last year, as part of the public service reforms, um, and the states uh, and Minister Hipkins, um, they established the role of the regional public service league um, as part of the reforms. And a, as a forerunner to, uh, as the minister would would say, of creating a more agile and adaptive public service, a public service um, that could not only operate in this 21st century environment, um, but also um, is adaptable to the needs of various communities as well. The, the role of the public service lead um, as established in 2019, really is to con uh, has a convening mandate to provide systems level leadership for the public service. Uh, in layman's language, essentially what that means is my job is to, uh, uh, to bring about a more joined up central government uh, in collaboration with regional leaders, both not only at central government level, but also business and community. Um, just uh, for context, um, there are 11 public service leads across the country um, and uh, most of them uh, come from the Ministry of Social Development. There are three of us from Education, one from Corrections as well. But, but essentially the, the role is to, um, as I mentioned, is, is the mandate to convene and bring together um, essentially central government agencies to have that more joined up approach as well. Um, as, as part of this slide, what I just want to share you, and so this is a bit of context, because uh, I think it's really important. Um, the, the role of, job of the regional public service lead was initially brought together uh, as envisaged um, as part of the reforms in the 2019 to bring together and convene the social sector. To bring together the social sector, to inform the skill sector, to drive the economic sector. So, because um, as you would appreciate in the regions, uh, the biggest footprint that the central government has within the regions is within the social sector. So, i.e., uh, Ministry of Social Development, Education, the DHBs, um, uh, uh, police, and so forth. And so, our biggest footprint is within the social sector. So, uh, in 2019, that was really the goal. The goal is to 
for this role to bring together the social sector to inform the school sector to drive the economy. Um, just this slide gives you an idea here of who the central government members are. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, again, th this is just a bit of context, um, and this is all pre-COVID, which is a term that we're all familiar with. Um, coming together central government agencies and providing that regional leadership is something that we've been, uh, that um, isn't uncommon and we've done for several years. Um, however, in 2015, after the a series of social sector trials up and down the regions, a central government agencies decided actually we need to do, uh, we need to be a lot more joined up in our approach, a lot more collaborative. Um, and so what we did is, uh, is establish what we call BOBSIG, which is the uh, Bay Plenty Collective Impact Governance Group. Now, of significance of this group, and this is really important, is that, that that governance group or that leadership group was essentially only central government agencies because that's traditionally the way that we've operated and the way that we've worked. Um, so this slide here, and I'll, I'll, um, I've assured Namuta and the team that I'll share these slides with you, just gives you a bit of background as to um, how we formalise and brought that group together. Um, Probably just again, um, as a result of us coming together, there are a number of things that we as central government agencies um, actually uh, agreed that we will work together on. And in fact, of significance uh, for this group, just to make you aware, is that um, probably uh, in March or February, March of this year, after a series of consultation with our, with our partner agencies, we, we, de we decided to develop our vision for ourselves as central government agency, which was that we wanted the Bay Peninsula to be the best place in Aotearoa for whānau to raise a child. Um, and so you could read there. Um, of significance though, is from that vision, we decided to, uh, uh, there were five themes that really came through in that vision as well. Um, and I, I won't read these individually, but you'll get a sense of them. Um, uh, but if I just cover them off, so the five, five themes that we talked about is that building our capability to engage and partner with Māori, acting early for child wellbeing, so that's really acknowledging the importance of early intervention, in, engaging the rangatahi and strengthening pathways, uh, safe and thriving whānau, and building communities. And when we talk about building communities, that, that's really about um, uh, another way of saying that um, thinking about the importance of housing and the homelessness issue that we have in the region. So um, the reason why these slides here paint a bit of a context, as I mentioned, these things are all pre-COVID. There are a couple of things though that I just really want to touch on, which is really important for this group and again for the invitation. There are two critical partners here that are missing, uh, local government uh, and iwi. So um, in the past, what we've traditionally done as central government agencies is that we've we tended to talk to each other about the things that are important for us. And although um, these five themes that we, uh, we agreed upon at the beginning of this year, um, most people wouldn't disagree with them. However, th this was from our lens at the central government agencies. But as I mentioned, there were two critical partners here missing, uh, was, was the importance of having iwi around the table and local government. So if I fast forward to where we are now, so the, um, sorry, uh, one of the things that we decided probably in March of this year is, um, I do want to acknowledge uh, Fiona uh, McTavish, the CE for the Bay Plenty Regional Council, where um, at a meeting uh, with Minister Hipkins, we invited at the end of 2019, is that we said actually, in order to, in order to, um, for these things to be truly authentic, that we needed, um, Two really, two really strong voices around the table, one being local government and two, the importance of iwi as well. And um, so our aspiration was always to have uh, um, have themes or priorities that, um, that touch on those two things. If I could just touch on now um, uh, from March and into the future and, and probably the relevance for this role, is that the, um, the inequities and disparities that existed pre-COVID um, have really come to the fore. Uh, and, and, and by way of an example, the economic and social impact. So the, the inequities, uh, the disparity that we're seeing now, those things existed before March. Um, but just to give you an example, the unemployment, um, traditionally at this, this time of the year, uh, and in conversations with my colleague, uh, Mike Bryan at MSD, um, traditionally across the Bay Plenty, unemployment can rage at this time of the year, particularly in winter when there's no seasonal work between 24 and probably at the speak to 28,000. Um, currently, um, according to uh, MSD, um, we're currently sitting at 32,000 unemployment. 
that employment uh, unemployment is projected to reach 40,000 before the end of Christmas, just to give you an idea of just how dire the situation is. And so um, really the opportunity for to connect, to coordinate and collaborate is probably more critical than ever before. Um, and so I, I see my role as a public service lead, that convening mandate to not only um, bring together and connect our central government partners, but more importantly, uh, the role of local communities and local government, uh, but also critically as well of iwi. Um, and so one of the, one of the tasks that, that I have is how do we establish a regional leadership as, as an enabler for local communities? Uh, because the difference in the delivery um, for whānau, uh, for iwi, uh, for families and individuals um, has to be at a local community level. So developing a regional leadership that is an enabler for local communities, not a roadblock, a cheerleader for communities, uh, rather than uh, uh, to try to control that as well. So um, I, I talked about the, the five themes that central government agencies talked about, um, but one of the things that we have, uh, we did during COVID uh, was an opportunity for us to engage with um, several of our iwi partners. Um, and one of the things that really, um, uh, that really they really impressed on us and um I, I, I might slip the slide over here i might sorry uh, um i might skip this slide and probably go to um uh our, our conversations with iwi and how things have shifted since then i talked earlier on about the importance of having iwi and local communities at the table but one of the things that um that really came to the fore when we were engaging uh, with iwi particularly our, some some of our iwi partners during COVID. Um, and as we come down to local levels, was um, was not necessarily about the themes that I talked about. So um, our EU partners didn't um, didn't disagree at all with our priorities or the themes. However, the question they asked us is, um, why is it that we want to work together? What are the principles that we uh, should agree upon as to why we would want to work with uh, with me as as a public service lead, or, or why should we want to engage with central government? And so the, the, the gift that uh, we've had from Iwi is the question they ask us is what are the principles that bring us together to work together? Um, and I just want to say that this is probably an exciting uh, piece of work because probably for the first time it's rather than us focusing on um, the what we need to do, it's why we need to do it. And so if I just want to spend a bit of time talking about the principles um, that we've in our conversations with Iwi about how we want to operate and work together. Uh, that first principle around whenua is that uh, one of the things that uh, our, um, our EV partners talked about is um, we want to be a region noted for um, putting the environment first. Our sense of community is shaped by a connectedness to the environment. Um, and uh, experience tells us is that a community that cares for its, uh, cares for its environment, cares for its people. So Fenua being a fundamental principle in the way that we operate and the way that we work. The second bubble uh, or the second principle that we talked about is that whole notion of justice. Now, this isn't a ministry of justice. This is about the whole so uh, notion of our fairness in social justice, of communities caring for each other, of fairness, care, and doing the right thing, helping us through our differences. Um, that seemed to be a really strong principle coming through in our conversations. The third principle, which um, I think was really important as well, is that although there's been a huge emphasis on employment and jobs, and I've talked about the unemployment projections for us as a region, one of the other, the third principle that uh, Iwi talked with us ab about, and certainly in our conversations with Fiona and the team, the regional council, was the whole principle of, of livelihood. That we weren't just talking about jobs for today that might not exist over the next six or 12 months, but how do we, we uh, let's, if we can change the dialogue from jobs to livelihoods. So that's about a economy that works for our communities as opposed to a community that works for its economy. It's about um, uh, people's contribution to their community, to their whānau as well, and that sense of self-worth and value. So livelihoods being a really critical principle. Again, that, that uh, emphasises that whole notion of uh, strengthening that, um, that notion of the from cradle to career uh, and everything that goes with it as well. The, the third principle that we, um, that we talked about with our iwi partners and with ourselves as well is that whole principle of energy. Again, this is about um, uh, are we as a region open to a new way of doing things and living and working? Um, and so we talked about things like food and energy production. One of the uh, uh, one of the, the areas that has, um, if I could just just mention, um, 
uh, that um, if you think about the disparity that existed is uh, the inequity that we do have around connectivity, for example. Um, and so um, that principle about energy, about getting things moving, connecting people, getting people access, not only physically, but also digitally as well. And so one of the things that we've discussed over the last uh, few weeks um, and our aspiration to have a, a leadership group that is inclusive of iwi and local government and communities has accelerated. But more importantly, what, ha what has uh, come out as a result of this is more importantly, these principles about how we want to operate and work together. And so um, uh, one of the things that we have been doing over the last few weeks is engaging with a number of agencies and with our iwi partners, socialising and talking about these principles. And by and large, this was quite strong support in this approach and the way that we operate as well. And so I thought I just want to share some of those principles uh, with you. Um, uh, this slide here, and again, um, I'm just conscious of our time, so I won't go through it too much, but um, one of the... Um, one of the key things here is that, um, and, and uh, although there is quite a strong discussion about recovery, and, and no doubt, um, that's critical. Um, one would argue actually that um, we're still in response mode. Um, and although um, uh, there has been some really great work happening at a, both a TLA level, district level, <coughs> as well as iwi level around uh, economic recovery and so forth, um, one would argue that actually we're still in response. And if the warnings that we've had from our health professionals are anything to go by, is that, um, uh, as we all appreciate, it wouldn't take much for us as a, as a country or as parts of the region to slip back down the, uh, the alert levels as well. So um, what, one of the things that we talked about, which is why we've moved away from our priorities and themes to principles, is that we're wanting to uh, work and operate in a way that's a lot more enduring. Um, and so... Um, this, this slide here just gives you a, a sense of um, what we're trying to build here, which is, um, is, is that whole adage of if you build it, they will come. So we want an approach that is more principle driven as opposed to structure driven. Uh, we want to focus on bringing together strong leadership um, that really has a strong line of sight between um, at a regional level, but more, more critically from a, a, a local level. Uh, we talk about eyesight, not oversight. So this is about bringing together people that have strong regional oversight and, and eyesight, sorry, eyesight at a local level, being able to bring all, all that strong intelligence uh, from, uh, from local communities, from individuals in whānau, um, uh, so um, that can help inform uh, the regional leadership team to, uh, to remove any of the roadblocks that are required uh, from central government. And probably really critically as well is that, um, and you probably you note here is, um, Absolutely, the, the role of a of a regional leadership is 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 the enabler because delivery absolutely has to happen at a local level as well. And so, um, this this gives you a, of of a sense of um, of what we've been talking about. And uh, this slide here, and can I just note too, is at um, uh, gives you a sense of um, that line of sight or or a diagram talking about. Um, uh, the importance of of, uh, of the centre supporting uh, local communities as well. And we've changed our language from actually about, uh, we're talking about delivery enablement. So um, <coughs> I see the role of the regional public service leaders not only being able to bring together and to connect local communities to um, the central government, but, but more importantly for um, to utilise this role um, to not only inform local uh, central government of what certain concerns, issues and needs are, but also to convene the right leaders to remove some of the roadblocks that might get in the way over here as well. Uh, so th this slide just, just gives you a, a visual illustration of, um, of uh, the, um, I guess, the, the shift from, um, if you recall those first slides, of having a strong central government focus to actually a more enabling approach which is how we can be a lot more connected to the work that happens at a local level, uh, utilising those principles as, as an approach, to, as a framework in which we would work, um, really to inform and support some of our local communities as well. Um, uh, Madam Chair, at this point, I might just pause here because I, I realise I've been, I've probably uh, sucked all the air out of this room and I realise that there may be, may be questions from the floor. Thank, thank you, Ezra. Um, Really, really interesting. I'm sure there will be questions. So, councillors, questions to Ezra. Councillor Clark. 
Ignorant, yeah, um, can't I? Question is, how are these principles of justice, value, life, thought, and energy being articulated in our educational institutions? I kind of, you know, the thought that it should start with the tamariki upwards through our schools as part of this process. So, do you have any focus on the inputs in there? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good, good question. And in many ways, it's, it's a question that. Um, uh, we had a fascinating discussion last week with the um, with a number of other uh, sector leaders as well. Uh, but it, absolutely, one of the um, if, if I give a, a very live example uh, uh, that we're going through with education about those notions of justice and livelihoods. If I think about justice, so as you may recall, during the lockdown levels, um, for the first time, we offered to provide uh, connectivity and devices. Uh, to students in lower decile schools, particularly during NCA uh, levels one, two, and three. And although we we knew that there was the inequity in our system, particularly for some of our um, more rural communities, um, that inequity uh, there has been a huge light shone on that. So, um, for example, um, we may have been able to get devices to students in some of those more uh, um, low decile areas and more rural areas. However, uh, it's no point having a device if they weren't able to connect to the internet. Um, likewise too, that um, uh, schools generally um, that were able to, um, uh, that were able to engage with their whānau, uh, what we realise is that um, whānau and iwi know their communities a lot better than what we did. And we made a huge assumption that schools actually knew their communities. Many of them did not. Um, the, uh, the disparity that we have, particularly for, uh, particularly for students of uh, learning support and Māori, uh, were probably particularly exacerbated. Um, and so that whole, um, that whole principle of justice um, or, or, uh, or any, um, uh, of that unconscious bias is something certainly that um, has really come to the fore. And if I, uh, again, probably another example of that is um, in this region, um, we have 57% of, of students who regularly attend school. We've got 60,000 students in our region. Um, the national average is 59%. In parts of our region, um, attendance can go down as low as 37%. If I can just repeat that again, there are parts of our region where only 30% of students actually attend school. And one of the big concerns that we have now is some of those stats uh, existed pre-COVID, but I think the, um, with the, uh, the, the economic and social pressures on whānau now, we're really concerned that uh, some of that disparity will grow even more. So that, that whole principle of justice and working together with our whānau and iwi are probably more critical than, than what we've ever had. Councillor Nays. <clears throat> Thank you. It's it's great to hear um, how public uh, sector delivery is being transformed and working well with us in the regions. I see in your um, the line across the bottom, um, you have the Bakery Regional Council in some of those um, areas, mm -hmm. um, and yet we have local delivery. So how is um, the other side of local government, the, the, the local councils, being integrated into this work? Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a very good question and, and something that um, we continue to work really strongly on um, at the moment. Um, if you, um, and again, I'll share my, um, I probably won't, I, I won't attempt to share this PowerPoint again because knowing my technology, I'll probably turn the system off. Um, but one of the things that you may, um, may have noted in that diagram is that we, we actually talk about the importance of that local community or the districts at the very top. Um, uh, and so, um, Currently, and again, this is a this is a, a very forming uh, um, a piece of work. Where um, one of the things I'm really grateful for is the support of the regional council in this work as well, and connecting us to uh, the other uh, six TLAs or the six districts as well. Um, but I, I would envisage that they will play an absolute critical part. Um, they know our districts and our, our our local communities know their whānau much better than what we do with central government agencies and I imagine the regional council as well. And so um, that is something that we will continue to work together with our partners on to ensure that they're not only part of the delivery, but a critical part of the thinking and the design as well. Councillor Weish. Uh, tēnā koe, Ezra. Uh, tēnā koe, Matua. 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 Tēnā koe, Matua.
Thanks, Esther, for this uh, presentation. And um, you know, I think it's great to see the collaborative and cohesion uh, on paper. And I emphasize on paper at the moment because ultimately it's how it's expressed on the ground, which, which is my point really around how this is being communicated to, I guess, the grassroots level, if you like. I mean, at the moment, it seems certainly from my knowledge back in the Okure constituency, still hovering in the air. Obviously, you're going to have to get it down to the ground level and make that connection with iwi and hapu. How is that happening, Ezra? How, or what's the sequence of events to, to drive that, that particular space? It's a, it's, um, it's a very good question. And I guess in many ways, um, uh, it's a, it's an ongoing dis, it's an ongoing discussion we're having with our right partners as well as, as as you can appreciate and I absolutely agree that the difference will be made when we have people within our local communities talking about the difference well actually not necessarily talking about the structure but actually talking about the difference that this will make as well um, so there probably there are a number of, uh, there are um, the number of different levels in which this is happening um, if I could be brutally honest with the select committee here um, actually oh. it, it, it took us uh, it took us 18, or actually it's taken us a little bit longer, a uh, number of years to bring together central government agencies to agree on a regional vision um, and to, um, to many ways take off their respective hats to work together. Um, and likewise, I would imagine that, that local communities and certainly Fano will also have a view as to how they want to operate. Um, so I, I guess to answer your question, um, I, th I think that is, um, the proof in the pudding is, is how this is uh, how this is expressed at a local level. Um, what we have done initially, uh, Matu, is bring together um, uh, a number of quite key leaders, not representing all of our iwi across the uh, the rohe, um, but to bring together some of the, our key uh, leaders across it, just to um, to convene and to come together to get some of our thinking right. Um, and so the, the, the mahi over the next few months really is to ensure that we could get some uh, some shared language, some sh shared key messages in order to um, to drop that down into our local communities as well. Um, and probably to give you an example of just how um, sometimes that could be quite uh, uh, complex and we are working in this quite complex environment is if I consider the, the, the good work that our civil defence and management have done around uh, caring for communities and their transition from that to MSD and to health, for example. Um, and although on paper, again, um, that transition looks like it's, uh, it's happening, the reality is uh, um, it, we require the, the right people and the right relationships in order for that to happen. So um, I, I guess to answer your question, it's, it's happening at a whole lot of different levels and um, as to how we need to communicate that. But I think initially it's about convening the right people, get our thinking right, um, and then really developing a really strong communication strategy as to how we want to connect with our local communities. Councillor Rose, then Councillor Ishii. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I guess, um, first of all, I want to say well done um, on what you've presented to us so far. Um, it, is, it is really good to see that rangata here being uh, brought into the, into the situation. But I, get, I guess what, what I want what I want to bring up is um, like how, how are you speaking to the rangatahi? Because the thing is, is if you look at the, if you look at the, I'll, I'll put it this way, if you look at the battleground that we've currently got, the rangatahi are stepping up to the plate and talking about things like climate change, you're talking about things like racism, all of that kind of jazz. And I guess my, my big question is how, how did you, Ezra, um, plan on speaking to our rangatahi and ensure that their voices are actually being heard um, during this time of recovery/response that is a very good question <laughs> it's something that um, it's something that I've been talking with our school leaders about um, if I just talk about my other role within education because you're absolutely right when we have talked about the response to COVID we tend to talk to the adults not the young people who experience it this first hand um, that is something, can I just say here though, regarding I think your point um, of relevance to this discussion, that isn't probably something that we have, um, that we have talked a, a lot about, but I've really made it a note here um, 
about how do we ensure that we can reach down in Tarangatahi, and whether that's through um, uh, the various channels that uh, through through councils or regional council, or uh, certainly through our iwi, I think as a group we'll be really open to how we go about doing that as well. But I, I am, um, Elia, I, I acknowledge that is a that is a huge gap in that, and um, and you're right. I mean, there is a huge movement at the moment, not only nationally but globally. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, the climate change discussion, all of these things are really coming to the fore. So uh, I do know in education, uh, being able to bring that, that, that uh, young person, the rangatahi voice is probably more critical, but um, hearing from you loud and clear that that's probably something that um, is not being explicit and we need to, we need to, um, we need to insert that at, at the heart of what we do. But I, I guess I just wanted to also and ensuring that we're speaking not just to the leaders of the rangatahi, ensuring we're speaking to those who are actually being impacted by this. Because the thing is, is when I, when I hear people talk about speaking to the rangatahi, we talk about it and it's looking at, our, at the leaders, those who are up being like, yep, that's me, that's me. But really, the voices that we should be hearing are those who don't usually get that opportunity to step up and actually say, yeah, that's me. So I guess that's just one other note I'd like I'd like you to note down, is making sure you talk to the rangatahi down here, not just the rangatahi who are up, up right. in that sector there. So Good thank point. you for that though, Ezra, very well done. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, if there are any, um, listen, if, if there are particular groups or networks or, or so forth that um, you may suggest for us to be part of that initial discussion, please uh, forward them through to Amuta and the team and I'll we'll ensure we follow them up. But that's that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Councillor Eji. Madam Chair. Tēnā koe, Ezra. Tēnā koe. Um, my question is around the four principles. So, uh, around this table, we uh, talk often about the four well beings, uh, and we um, view a lot of our, our work through that lens. I'm just interested as to um, why you've moved, or this seems to be a paraphrasing or reiteration, another iteration of the four well beings, what the reasoning was. As to why you've developed the principles rather than going along the lines of the four well beings? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. And, and some of these things uh, evolve actually, because um, actually, one of the things that I, I may have um, uh, I'd not have added there is that um, those five themes that we talked about, uh, various, uh, as part of the, our refresh as central government agencies, we moved from those those, prior, those five themes to the, the well-beings, as you talked about, uh, the social, uh, cultural, economic, and environmental well-being. Um, however, it was probably the discussion we had with some of our iwi partners where they talked about, um, uh, in, in, in many ways, that they're very similar, but as you probably from what from hearing from you as well, they're also quite distinct. Um, and um, so it, it was really the conversation we had with some of our iwi partners and probably a good example of that is that we had the, 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 the real pleasure uh, of sitting down with uh, Tatimu uh, Tehuhu and Tufaritoa when we talked about some of our principles and their way that we work. And one of the things that um, it was, it was a, I mean, one of the things that he was really quite pleased with is that um, we weren't turning up talking about educational health or social well-being. We were, we were talking about things like social justice and so forth. And so, um, in many ways, um, yes, they, uh, we, we did have a focus on those well-beings, but it was probably more our conversation with some of our iwi partners where we probably saw them as an opportunity to, to broaden them out a little bit more. Uh, and in many ways, the, the justice principle, for example, was a really good example where we talked about actually doing the right thing um, and caring for others. And so, you know, what does that mean from an educational point of view, from a health point of view? Again, the principle of livelihoods around not only this isn't about just jobs and economic well-being, but this is also, also about a sense of worth about people's contribution to their community as well. Um, and so again, it was probably um, it was probably a shift. Uh, uh, it's probably the conversation that we had with our EU partners where we had that shift. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Um, if, if not, Ezra, thank you uh, very very much for. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Kevin. 
Councillor um, It's not a question, it's a comment, Madam Chair. Good morning, Ezra. Good morning. Um, uh, you talked about being brutally honest with us, Ezra, but I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Um, I was Mayor of Rotorua for nine years, and in that time, uh, there was a little girl by the name of Nia Glassie who was murdered by her parents or her caregivers. And she was murdered on my watch. And uh, in the aftermath of that, I called a mayoral summit of all the public service government departments in Rotorua. And I had justice, I had education, I had police, I had MSD, I had work and income, I had ECEs, I had NGOs, uh, Māori Women's Welfare League, all in the same room to say to them, how did we fail this little baby? And um, everybody had a piece of the jigsaw, Ezra, in terms of the care of that child, but nobody put it together and to, to say she was in danger. And I hear your words today, Ezra, and nothing's changed. Um, Ten years ago, I had the same conversation with public service, government departments, and we're still working in silos. And, I hate, and I'm being brutally honest, and I may be in trouble for saying this today, but we're still failing 10 babies a year in New Zealand in terms of being murdered by their peer, caregivers. And I just think we haven't changed in that time. And, you know, you're in a position to do something. I'm in a position to do something, but still nothing's been done. We're still working in silos. And the coroner said into Nia Glassie's death, uh, there were too many silos. How are you bringing about the silos working together? Because you said local government's a a absent. Uh, I disagree, sir. I disagree strongly. We were there right from day one trying to bring the public service together. I'll leave it at that, Madam Chair. That's killed the conversation probably, by the way, too. That sucked a bit of the air out, hasn't it? <laughs> well, I've got, to be, I've got to be brutally honest with you, Ezra. I heard it 10 years ago. Um, Madam Chair, if I could, um, just a, this is a brief response and to uh, thank Councillor Williams. Uh, for your comments as well, and um, probably a, a poignant reminder as to why this mahi is so critical. Um, as to um, there is no doubt at all um, of the tragedy of uh, of that, that gorgeous girl, and, and in many ways really goes to the heart of. Um, and I know we didn't talk about it today in too much detail, uh, Madam Chair, but you're absolutely right. Is that um, um, the, it was the failure of the system that that enabled uh, some of these tragedies to happen, and so one of the one of the um, one of the key changes of the Public Service Act, and I, I know at some point, Madam Chair, might be a good opportunity to maybe come back to this group later on. Um, but with the changes in the Public Service Act, um, for agencies to stop working in those silos, Councillor Williams. Um, not only central government agencies, but also to reach into other local communities to, to um, uh, not just focus on, on their remit or their vote, um, but work in the best interests of whānau and children is, is an aspiration, but um, has, has been an aspiration in the past. Um, but um, uh, with, the, uh, with the legislation last year allowing a lot more deliberate coordination um, at a local level between different agencies, so we don't uh, we don't repeat the wrongs of the past of being able to work in a silo. So, um, listen, I, I do acknowledge um, your words, uh, Councillor Williams, and um, listen, it's um, part of part of my part of my job is to try to break down some of the silos across our agencies. And as you can appreciate, we've had 30 years of of of, way of doing things, but I agree with you that there is an opportunity for us to do things quite differently. Um, I'm really encouraged by the relationships that we're really starting to form. Uh, and I just want to clarify, I, I didn't, I didn't, um, wasn't saying that local government was absent. I was talking about the fact that the central government agencies, when we developed our leadership team, uh, we were only talking to each other as opposed to local government. So I just really want to clarify that. But um, I do acknowledge your words, and I think the, the challenge is really, the challenge and opportunity for us is how we can work better together in order to ensure that these things don't happen again. Uh, thank okay. you, Madam Chair. No, thank you, uh, Ezra. We have three further uh, speakers. Uh, that was actually Councillor Kevin Winters. Oh, um, my apologies. That's okay. So I have Councillor Thurston, 
then I have our chief executive, and then I have myself, and then that's a councillor Thurston. Hello, Falava, Israel. Talofa. Talofa. Um, further on from what councillor Winter said, is Fano Aura on the flight deck of this initiative? Are they uh, right inside the tent, uh, Israel? Uh, yeah, Fano Aura. Um, work through our other partners through Orang Tamariki and, and MSD as well, uh, uh, Lyle. Um, and uh, been, we probably, I haven't been engaging with them directly on this, but some of our other partner agencies who are close to them. Um, and part of our challenge or part of the work that we've got to do is how do we make all these connections with, all, with critical groups like Fano Order and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I Israel. Right. I just wanted to give some more uh, information to the committee. Uh, it has been a really a real privilege of mine to sit with ESRA and a number of the other um, agencies and talk to particularly Iwi and be at Hui for the very first time that all central government agencies have been in attendance and to hear in terms of the aspirations and needs of Iwi and Hapu in our region. Uh, a really good example of some of the change that has been able to happen is uh, we contacted uh, Ezra during COVID uh, because the Ministry of Health was not aware that we uh, provided um, school bus services that were independent from the network ourselves in Auckland. And if you recall, when we moved to level two, we still had to keep the social distancing on the school buses and uh, we're as opposed to the Ministry of Education funded, funded services did not. Uh, Ezra was able to sort that for us and so that um, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council funded services had the same standards as the Ministry of Education funded services. And it was really because of the um, people just wanting the best outcomes and these connections um, really did help our communities. And it was a tangible example that you had talked about uh, during COVID. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just one final comment from me, Ezra, uh, in terms of Sorry, I just wanted to, um, in terms of your line of sight diagram, it would be good if the communities could be at the top. Because I would make the comment, as Councillor Nees has said, that local government um, should be able to represent some of the views of community, but community are best to do that themselves. Okay. And so please don't think that just because local government's sitting at the table that you're necessarily actually getting uh, the real deal and the real oil actually from communities and communities of interest. So Ezra, I want to, on behalf of the committee, thank you very, very much for the time you've taken this morning. It's been very interesting. It's obviously extremely challenging and we wish you uh, extremely well and look forward to uh, continual updates. Um, so thank you, and I'll now move receipt of the report. Seconded by Councillor White. All those in favour, aye, against, carried. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.